it is a core tenet of fascist politics that the goal of oratory should not be to convince the intellect but to sway the will now this is my favorite quote of anything that i read in the book that i'm going to be reviewing today and the book is how fascism works and it's by jason stanley now jason stanley i did a small amount of research into him he's a philosopher he's, if i'm not mistaken i believe he's the head of philosophy at yale university so definitely knows his stuff now if you're brand new to the channel uh, welcome if you've been following along with the different books i've been reading you'll know that i'm reading 52 this year and my goal was to make sure that i moved around all different genres of books so today is definitely a political education book and uh, i'm excited to jump into it so uh, let's talk about it so unlike a fantasy book which is you know what i've mainly been reading um this book here is is obviously more rooted in the day-to-day -day world there's a lot more fact in there less fiction so the way i'm going to go through the summary is there are chapters in this book i believe there's somewhere between eight and ten and I'm just going to give you the name of each chapter and essentially what that chapter is about and how it makes sense to the overall topic of the book. So normally I would say there's spoilers or not spoilers. I mean, it's a political book. You live in the world that we live in, therefore you're already gonna know a lot of what we've seen here. So I'm gonna go through the summary. Um, after that, I'm gonna tell you a bit about what I loved and maybe what I didn't like about the book and then really just give my recommendation at the end. Um, so let's get into it. So this book was definitely written as a, an educator, essentially, towards political science. I, I believe that Jason Stanley probably saw something um, in the world today and, you know, uh, in America especially, uh, that he decided, well, that is definitely fascism. And he decided that a lot of people need to understand and know more about it, which was really the reason why I decided to read this book was um, I don't know much about politics. And although I get very interested and excited about it, when people throw out terms like fascism, communism, uh, socialism, libertarianism, authoritarianism, like I, I feel like I have a general idea of what those are, but not enough to have an intelligent conversation. Um, and that's the reason why I decided to read this book. So the first thing that we need to really understand is, well, what is fascism? And although there's plenty of different types of fascism, I believe what Jason Stanley um, kind of defines it as is ultra-nationalism ultra um, being used to take control of a location and of an area that also leads to authoritarianism, which is a tough word to say. So forgive me if I say it wrong at any point, but essentially means that it's uh, very strict and run by one person and that person essentially runs everything. And that's a scary way to look at the world, um, but it doesn't happen overnight. If we look at some fascist um, dictators previously, and fascism can be used in, in tandem with other things. So you have people like Stalin, who was fascist, but in a socialist way. You have people like Hitler, who were very fascist as well. And it's really, well, how did these people come to power and how did they um, go from you know, a population of people who were democratic and move them, move them into the idea of fascism because it's not like an overnight switch. The first chapter is called The Mythic Past. And what that really entails is the first thing we need to do if we're going to take power as a fascist dictator or just as a fascist leader is I need people on my side. So I need to paint a picture that gets people excited for change. The first thing I'm going to do is going to create a mythic past. And what that means is, is I'm going to constantly be pushing the idea that we as a people, we as a country, we as a culture, uh, we as a class, we as a religion, whatever group I'm trying to create, we were better off previously whether it's 50 years ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, some cases a thousand years ago, I need to get people behind the idea that right now we're not in our prime, the world isn't as good as it could be, or our country isn't as good as it could be, and it used to be. When it was just us, it was amazing and everything was going perfectly. The thing about this is it's nearly never true, like standards nearly always uh, increase in countries. Um, diversity increases, equality increases, standard of living such as uh, medicine, entertainment, travel nearly always increases but creating this mythical past of how good things used to be is the first key step um, in our fascist journey. The next step is propaganda. Propaganda is something that I've heard so much and I felt like I had a decent idea of. Um, what propaganda is used for is, let's take for example Nazi Germany um, the Jews were going to have, you know, to put it mildly, a terrible time under fascist Nazi rule. Um, however, what propaganda is used for is it's to give off the idea that that's not going to happen. You hide fascist and um, oppressive and persecutive 
if that's a word, um, laws that are really going to spell some disastrous times for smaller and oppressed groups, and you hide them behind widely accepted ideals that people do enjoy and that they do like as well. An example for that would be uh, the war on crime that was waged by a certain US president. And um, that war on crime on paper is a, a widely accepted ideal. If you ask any individual in the street, um, would you like a war on crime? Everyone would say yes, because less crime equals good. But what war on crime really meant for that US president was uh, an opportunity to oppress, especially minority groups such as black people in the US. And it was an opportunity for them to incarcerate these people uh, for smaller and smaller things and really class them as dangerous and um, a, a criminal class of people and uh, war on crime sounds great but really it was just locking up huge amount of minority groups um, for the for the the goals and the fascist goals of, of that president to uh, to continue so that would be an example of propaganda the next chapter that Jason Stanley delves into is anti-intellectual which really means the opposite of um, intelligence what he means here is is that what's something that's really important for a democratic society is public discourse. Public discourse is an opportunity for people to share ideas, for speeches, for education. And the goal is that it comes from all angles. So you have an opportunity to learn about people who don't look like you, don't sound like you, and come from different places. And this creates a large amount of unity in um, countries or locations or groups where there is a diverse type of people because without that you, you don't get to know each other and therefore you only see things from your point of view now for fascism you don't want that unity you want to create divides and create groups and that's really important so what being anti-intellectual is all about is you will see fascist groups as, uh, attempt to and sometimes successfully uh, go into places such as universities and other locations where there's education and learning and ideas are being shared and uh, groups and unity is being formed and what they will do is their goal is to disrupt that now, depending on where their powers are at that point, some things that they can do is uh, they can go in there and remove any teachings that um, aren't congruent and don't align with what they said the mythical past was. And this was an opportunity for them to really solidify the mythical past. And one book that I actually reviewed before, 1984, which is just here, uh, talks about this a lot. And I believe they say, um, whoever controls the past controls the future and whoever controls the present controls the past and what it means is if you control the information if you control the narrative that gets given to people they're never going to find anything out or anything different so they'll have to take that as truth and that's a really important part of a fascist regime is to ensure that people don't see things from other points of view and that you get to control the information that's given the next step is unreality now if these first couple of steps have been successful what it does is it creates a large majority group that are feeling very fearful um, and they feel a massive sense of loss and injustice to that group, even though they are the dominant group in that society most of the time. And what their goal now is, is fascism is a very patriarchal idea. Um, it doesn't mean that women can't be involved and spearhead it, but typically it's been patriarchal. So um, it really gives um, like old time value. So what they want to do is install one patriarch, which would be the leader. So what unreality is all about is once this leader, let's say Hitler, for example, comes into power, it's up to him to really give out the truth and give examples. And because everyone's so bought into this one person, you no longer um, are a country, you're no longer like truth and ideals. Whatever this person says completely goes because you now trust this person inside and out. And really you look at them as the father of the nation. And what unreality really means is that they will say things that directly um, contradict what reality is. But by this point, everyone's so bought in and so angry and scared. And they're looking at this person like their dad. And uh, they'll take that person's word over sometimes what their eyes and ears could tell them if they relaxed enough. Kind of like when we're kids. So anybody who had a strong father figure or mother figure or anybody who was raising them. Now I know sometimes uh, maybe when they tell you, you know, Santa Claus is real. Even though really when you're a kid, you do think, well, you know, how could this happen? And you have questions, but because your parents said it, okay, that must be how it is. I'm not sure if that's the world's greatest example, but it was the one that sprung to mind. The next chapter talks about hierarchy. Now it's really important to create these separations of types of people if our fascist government is going to work. So 
one of the first things uh, we need to do is figure out, well, how are we splitting people up? What groups am I trying to get involved? Now, some of the classic ones is race. Uh, race is often used. Uh, so the color of people's skin or where they were born. Um, religion is often used as well. It could be class, so how much money people have. Let's say you're trying to set up a fascist but communist society, then really you're just trying to appeal to either just the middle class or the lower class or maybe even just the upper class, depending on what your goals are. Um, it could also just be um, people who speak a certain language, people who look a certain way, people with a certain type of sexuality. It really depends, but you want to set a clear hierarchy of importance of people essentially. Now what's important in this hierarchy and the reason we set it is because one group, normally the vast majority and the larger one, which is why he talks about ultra nationalism being important because you will always have a majority in that country of people from that country. Um, your goal is to elevate those people above everybody else. Um, to give off the idea that these people are more important, we are better in every way, shape or form and uh, everyone around us is maybe not even human you know that would be an extreme example but um, we have seen it before unfortunately and uh, what that means is is it gives these people that you're trying to appeal to a sense of um just heightened important and and it really dehumanizes the people who are unfortunately about to be horrifically uh repressed and even sometimes genocide occurs so it's important this stage that people feel like they're not um uh, oppressing and uh, committing a genocide on people like them it's all about division and that's what the hierarchy is for the last thing about the hierarchy as well is it's impossible to fact check um, because you no longer have any information uh, based on the anti-intellectual part where you cut out the information you don't have any more opinions from those people they don't have a voice they don't have public speakers they don't have classes or courses that explains this person's opinion and their backstory and why you know, uh, they do things a little bit differently. So because you're unable to fact check and you just take the word of the patriarchal leader, um, it's a really effective way to create the divisions necessary for the horror that fascism often brings in. The next step that Professor Stanley talks about is victimhood. Now that we have this large group of people um, who stick together, feel really strongly about the patriarchal leader, but also do not like any of these smaller groups that have really been segregated. We want to create the idea of victimhood. What victimhood is, is you create the idea that the large group is being suppressed, um, that they need to be fearful of the smaller groups. And using that idea, any attempts from a smaller group to get equality um, to try and not put themselves above the you know the larger group, but to give themselves a fighting chance, to give themselves an opportunity to stop being suppressed, you essentially market that as them attempting to gain dominance and attack the larger group, and it creates this idea of victim victimhood in the group that has everything that is um, really really privileged. So it's although it's you know for terrible means, it is an interesting and very intelligent way to create an angry mob that will uh, that will follow you. Uh, the next chapter is called Law and Order. And using this bias and this victimhood, what you do is you create very, very harsh uh, laws and punishments for the persecuted group. So let's talk about Nazi Germany. And in this example, uh, Jews were being locked up, sent to concentration camps with no knowledge of what date they'd be released. And you know, as we now know, so many would actually be killed, uh, and murdered and put to forced labor for large periods of their life. And this sometimes was for things such as like traffic violations, um, for uh, jaywalking in the street. And really what it was for was for being Jewish. And what this does is, that's a really extreme example of fascism, but let's say even if we're talking about the war on crime, which essentially locked up black people for long periods of time for very, very small or sometimes no offenses at all, not only does that create, it has like a domino effect, not only is that extremely unfair um, just for that individual, but it also wrecks their family. Um, and it was disproportionately black males that it was happening to. And what that means is, is that now those children grow up without a father figure, which often leads to a life of crime, or at the very minimum, it leads to confusion and a lack of role models. Now your role models that are left are all um, you know, much younger, which is sometimes tougher. But it also means that maybe that family is going to struggle financially. Um, it also means that when that person comes out of prison, because prison really doesn't reform and it's not really, the goal isn't really to reform, it's probably going to be a bigger criminal when they come out than when they went in. So when that family finally gets a role model back, they might actually have a criminal back. 
um, which is unfortunate. I think it's Shawshank Redemption that said, you know, I never committed a crime until I was sentenced for one, something along those lines. So the long-term effects are disgusting and detrimental to these groups of people of these types of law and order that these fascist governments put in place. And the final thing that it does, uh, which is like a self-fulfilling prophecy, is the, the larger group of people, um, the oppressors, so to speak, they see huge amounts of these minorities being locked up, being taken away. And because there's this huge trust in the patriarch, it essentially solidifies the fake and false um, propaganda lies about how evil, nasty, criminal, and um, just bad these smaller groups are. And it just creates huge division wedges. And we can even see in today's uh, world in multiple countries, but you know, I live in the US, so let's use the US as an example. There is still massive, massive repercussions from these types of you know, law and order campaigns of governments previously to everyday people today and people's opinions of those people as well. So it's very effective at you know, the final nail in that wedge essentially between groups. Uh, the next chapter is called Sexual Anxiety. Now, with sexual anxiety, uh, what this chapter talks about is fascism really creates a patriarchal society. Um, in a patriarchal society, the role of the man is to help out the nation as much as possible and put his blood, sweat and tears into that, into creating sometimes a war machine. Uh, the role of the woman is very simple. You stay home, you raise a family, you have as many children that can add to the pure bloodline as possible. Now, something that creates a lot of sexual anxiety is propaganda or now uh, say that the oppressed groups um, could corrupt the bloodline and they can do this by rape and they can't control their sexual urges. This is something that is, uh, spreads a lot of worry. And this, again, is a very emotional worry rather than anything logical. Not that anything has been super logical so far, but it's a very emotional worry, a very primal worry, and it's a super effective, at, again, breaking bigger differences and more anger, and more hatred between people. And again, it's, it's just a lie. So the next step and the next chapter is called Sodom and Gomorrah. And I actually had to look this up, but Sodom and Gomorrah, I hope I'm pronouncing these right, were uh, locations in the Bible that were destroyed. They were cities and they were destroyed by God because they were full of sin, essentially. And uh, what Jason Stanley alludes to here is that um, for fascism to work, a huge contributing factor that we've seen through a lot of history is that um, the countryside is a stronghold for fascism because it's less diverse, they have less opinions already, and they really most likely only have people from that country or from that race or from that location there, meaning that they're more susceptible to these biases and these prejudices. Now, what a fascist leader will do is they'll create large cities, well, the large city's already there, but they will create the idea that these large cities, let's say in America, maybe New York or Los Angeles or Chicago, uh, are the places where things are going wrong. It's where the lazy people are, it's where um, you know, people are draining resources and we're losing our culture and we're losing our identity. And the country, the country areas, sorry, like the rural areas, We'll get behind this idea and you'll see huge amounts of people from those areas vote for that party to get into power and it's a really effective way for them to utilize um, democracy to create their fascist reign moving forwards and you know sometimes there is never a vote again when a fascist um, leader gets in so it's important that they play by the rules the first time round. so this is a really effective for the way for them to do it uh, i hope i've interpreted that um, name correctly title of the chapter correctly and the final chapter is called Arbeit Macht Frey which I've probably mispronounced extremely effectively um, and it's German it stands for work will set you free and it's really the idea and this is a really strong one and you, this is one you see a lot in today in today's society it's the idea that um, hard work will set you free and hard work is the ideals of the fascism party and it's the idea that everyone from the large area are working hard they're putting into the system they're providing they're doing everything we should be and if everyone was like them it would be perfect and the people in the cities and the lazy and the people we're going to oppress and the the groups that we've driven wedges in between um you know themselves and uh, the large group that we're going to use to oppress these are all lazy they're all takers they don't work hard they're draining the system they're taking as much as they possibly can and we would be better off without them and obviously um, that is not great and it creates really strong emotions in people because it's not logical like the, the, the quote I put at the very start um, and this is really the final step before elections I suppose.
So before I move into what I loved, I just want to put a bit of a disclaimer out there. Um, I'm definitely not a political scientist. Uh, I'm not even that smart. So if you would like to know more about this topic, which I would definitely hope you would if you've watched this video this far, just read the book. It's an incredible book. It makes all the points with a lot more evidence, a lot more examples, a lot more eloquence and just effectiveness. And it's really, really fun to read as well. So please, 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 if you've watched this video so far, just go and read the book because it will give you a much better understanding. And there is the very large, I'd say medium chance that I've massively misinterpreted something, even giving you these small examples. So go and read the book. What did I love? So the first thing was, um, I loved how educated I felt after reading this book. Um, when I talk with people about politics and those who seem to know a lot of politics, it's very confusing because they throw out words and actually these words have huge concepts behind them like fascism, like communism, like socialism, like uh, libertarianism and authoritarianism and all of these different things. Um, and they, they throw them in willy-nilly in these conversations. And for me, it's so confusing because they're such big and vast topics. So to have a smaller understanding uh, of fascism is so exciting for me because now I know if I need to have a conversation or if, even if I just see it in day-to-day -day life, I can be like, oh, that's a key indicator of fascism moving forward. So something that I loved was how we communicated this. It was concise language. It was really, really clear. It was modern day examples. And if I didn't understand something, all I would do is I would just read that paragraph again and it would become uh, very, very clear to me. So I think probably he's an amazing communicator given his work at um, Yale University, Yale College, sorry. Um, so, you know, hats off to Jason Stanley. He made it very readable, very digestible, and I feel more educated. And honestly, I feel quite excited about maybe participating in politics moving forwards. Um, and because I understand a little bit more about it, I feel that I may be able to make a, a bigger difference moving forwards as well. So uh, it probably changed my life a bit, this book. Um, something that I didn't like was, there was a small amount because like I said, it's it's not so much subjective, it's more objective, these types of books, like it is what it is. The only thing that I didn't like that much was a, a huge amount of the um, examples were Donald Trump. And it's not that I don't agree that, you know, it, everything he said in there was true. It doesn't necessarily mean Donald Trump is a massive fascist, but he used him for quite a few examples. Um, but what I would say is that personally, I think that you can see this type of politics, um, not just across the globe, but even in both parties in America. I think... The reason why both parties would use something like this, not exactly like this at all, I'm not saying both are fascist, but um, why you can see uh, hints and uh, reflections and glimpses of these types of politics is because it's really important to get people excited to vote for you. And the sad thing is, um, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need um, you know, oppressors and the oppressed um, to create large majorities that will vote for us. But unfortunately, humans aren't perfect and therefore we won't live in a perfect world. So the sad thing is, is that these politics do work. Um, but yeah, my, I think maybe some examples of either side um, would be important. And I think it definitely shows where Jason Stanley's at in his head um, with regards to maybe his political views. I might be wrong, I didn't research this, but that's something that I, didn't dis that I did dislike, sorry. My recommendation, I would actually give this book an 8.5, which is probably the highest rank I've given a book so far, I believe. And the reason why is, is because this is the first book of this type that I've ever read. So I thought it was amazing. However, I don't have a huge pool to pick from. So I don't know, maybe in the future it will go down um, in retrospect, but maybe even go up in retrospect. I don't know, this might be a masterpiece of this genre. Um, the reason I wanted to read this was because I didn't want to read 52 fantasy books back to back. Um, and I would recommend anybody to read this because it gets you motivated and excited about doing something about the world that you are living in. And that's my entire review. If you've made it this far, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you learned a little bit. And if you feel like you learned a little bit here, then you should definitely go and read this book. Um, the next book I'm going to be reading, I believe, is going to be Animal Farm, which is, again, you know, slightly political. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, if you've enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, comment any books you would like to, uh, you know, maybe watch me review or even just interested in having me read. And mainly, thank you for your time.